standing for the reading of the scripture. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. In it, Jesus heals the slave of the centurion. After Jesus ended all of his sayings in, in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a slave who was dear to him, who was sick and at the point of death. After hearing about Jesus, the centurion sent elders of the Jews to ask Jesus to come and heal his slave. And when they came to Jesus, they begged earnestly, saying, the centurion is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation and built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Sovereign, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I am a man set under the authority of soldiers under me, and I say to one, Go. And he goes, and another, Come. And he comes, and to my slaves, Do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled at the centurion, and turned and said to the multitude that followed, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave well. May God add understanding to the reading of the gospel. Glory be to the Maker. That's an implicit recognition that while the temple is the central place of full worship, 
the God of Israel also has a relationship with the people beyond Israel, that is, the non-Jews. The presence of these non-Jews at the temple tells us, tells the world how great God really is. In a word, outsiders can demonstrate to the insiders what the insiders have been saying all along. Our God is a great God. The prayer is that there will be a day when people of all nations will worship the God of Israel. In Luke's story, Jesus healing the centurion's servant, we also see at work the principle of extending the boundaries. Or perhaps it might be closer to the truth to say that we see the overturning of the conventional way of looking at things. After giving what Luke called the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus enters Capernaum. The town will serve as a basis for his ministry. We're told that while Jesus is there, this centurion who has a slave, it is a slave that he really values. But there's one problem. A slave is sick at the point of death. From the bit of information that we can glean, Jesus is recognized by the centurion, by the centurion as a master teacher. Jesus is someone to be reckoned with as is the centurion. A centurion was a Roman military officer in charge of a company of a hundred men. That this man has a slave that he values is very revealing. Slaves were considered living tools. Roman owners of slaves could treat them as they saw fit. They could punish them whenever they wished and for whatever reason. They could even kill them if they wanted to. They were indispensable. The fact that this man cared enough about his slave to want to save him indicates that this was a good man, even a compassionate one. So much so that when he heard Jesus was in town, the man went out of his way to see that his servant got the help he needed. Interest, interestingly, the centurion does not confront Jesus himself with his request. Later we find out why. But for now, the man uses the existing network he has with the local Jewish leaders, the elders, to get his wishes accomplished. He uses them to get Jesus to come and heal the slave. These elders are quick to do the centurion's bidding. Think about that. They didn't even have a second thought about going to Jesus when they were asked. They lose no time in trying to convince Jesus, a Jewish teacher, to heal the slave of a non-Jew. In other words, heal an outsider. Or in what was probably their evaluation, even less than an outsider, more like a nobody, a slave, a tool to do the centurion's work. The elders appeal to Jesus, and it's based not on the fact that the slave needs help, but on the fact that the centurion they hold in high esteem. He's worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he, if this, who built our synagogue. So they were doing a, turning a favor. They wanted the centurion to like them in their community. So they would do anything he asked for them. A little pressure is put on Jesus to ensure that Jesus will come across with a good deed. It's as if to say, Jesus, you've got to heal the slave of this centurion. We owe him a great deal. Without so much of a question, Jesus goes to the elders to visit the centurion's house to see what he can do for the slave. But when he was not far off from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. The invitation is none other than for Jesus to heal the boy indirectly and from a distance. When Jesus hears this, he turns to the crowd and says, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found someone of such faith. Not even with the insiders have I found someone of such faith. Luke concludes his story with some crucial information. When the centurion's friends return home, they find the slave to be in good health and completely healed. Now, what on, the story, what on the surface, this story looks like it's about healing. It's not. It's about faith. The extraordinary faith of an outsider. I find the contrast in the story particularly enlightening. The Jewish elders judged the slave worthy of treatment. 
only because he's owned by the centurion. Jesus agrees, but for a different reason. The elders think Jesus should heal the boy because of the generosity of the centurion, this outsider. But Jesus is willing to heal the boy because of the centurion's own personal faith and trust. The centurion shows himself to be the one who trusts Jesus to heal his servant, even from a distance. The Roman officer does not feel he's worthy of having Jesus in his home. Another reason for that would be, if Jesus had entered his home, he would be deemed unclean. And he'd have to go through this cleansing ritual to be able to go back to the synagogue. The centurion probably knew that. What can an outsider teach us? For one, they can teach us that we don't have a corner on the market, whether it's in the church or in the world at large, because of all the power and wealth we have, we do not have a corner in the market. Americans can get the feeling that we know it all and that we're the point of it all, but we're not. But there are people of faith outside as well as inside the church. Secondly, in much the same way, we can learn from those outside that we are not the only ones that God loves. For us here at the church, I think there's another small lesson that we can learn. Maybe it's not so little after all. Jesus treated the centurion no differently than he treated the Jewish elders. He respected them both. He listened to what they both had to say. And he acted accordingly. In a word, he's treated the centurion like he was already an insider. And in the process, Jesus healed a hurting boy. A boy who was not even a Jew, not even a Roman, but a slave, a nobody. But in Jesus' eyes, he was just a boy who happens to be a somebody. He was a fellow human being in need of help. The moment the church stops acting like a club for the like-minded, and begins treating non-members the same as members, that's the day that the church will really become an outpost for the kingdom of God. And when the church begins to act like this, those outside might want to come inside and be with us. Would you join me in prayer? Eternal God, who in Jesus Christ redeems us from the sin that drives us apart and reconciles us with the love that brings us together, we thank you for Jesus, who has made us your partners in the covenant. We bless you for the vision with which you bless us through him, for the vision of yourself, whose love for all does not diminish your love for each, for the vision of us as individuals who move away from you does not slow your move toward us, for the vision of the community of believers whose history of the vision does not alter your desire for union, and for the vision of the world whose clamor for power does not silence your demand for justice. O oh God, grant us the faith of Solomon's prayer, the faith that calls the temple not by the builder's name, but by your name, the faith that looks not within the temple, but beyond for your dwelling place, the faith that longs for the temple to become a house of prayer, not for one people, but for all the peoples of the earth. It's in Jesus' name I pray.